From Cali to Tally, it's time to wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source, and this is Wake Up Warchant. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hudjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! You know what time it is. Wake Up War Chant, part of the Warchant.com family. Subscribe, rate, review the podcast if you please wouldn't mind. Uh, follow us on social media, Wake Up War Chant. Also, War Chant. Follow Corey and myself. And if you're not a member yet of the Ultimate Seminal Sports Source, it's never too late. Use the promo code WARCHANT30. Get you 30 free days of access. Check it out. Look around. Get yourself comfortable. Uh, become part of the family. Corey, how are you, my friend? I am good, buddy. I'm good. I'm always good. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I think I feel uh, mildly encouraged. Not going to talk too much about my personal life tonight, but that really uh, good-looking girl who uh, was kind of like not texting me back or whatever, messaged me back. So there's a a possible tentative date this weekend. So feeling good about that. Um, Does she know what you do? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay. So she doesn't know that you're talking about her in front of... What do we get? Like we get like one hundred fifty thousand downloads a day, something like that. Yeah, yeah, about give or take. Okay, give or take. A That's thousand. a lot of people that you're talking to her about, but you haven't said her name, so nobody knows. Right. And I will tell you uh, when we 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 link up what I did to pull her back into my uh, my loving grasp, because like I said, like sometimes these these conversations just go to nowhere, like to just it right. just just dies. And then you either just move on or you kind of have to slowly work your way back into it. So I had a pretty uh, crafty plan. I'll, I'll tell you that because I don't want to I don't want to ruin all my secrets and people don't really probably care all that much. We got sure. so much to talk about, Corey. We got a big and very good wake up war chant Renegade Express mailbag. Lots of good questions from everybody. Uh, the NFL draft is wrapping down uh, round one as we record this. Brian Burns is off the board. He's a Carolina Panther. Uh, you also got to hang out with Willie. On Thursday, or sorry, Wednesday in Atlanta, um, mm-hmm. lots to talk about from that. But let's 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 start from the most recent thing and work our way backwards. Burns going was it 16th overall to the Panthers? That was one of the teams I think uh, that was actually kind of uh, attached to his name throughout this process, which is crazy how it works out because you know for so long they always talk about misinformation and all that kind of stuff going out there. You know, um, in terms of you know what teams won. They're trying to throw people off, but it's crazy how so many times now, and and I'm talking about tipping off picks the night of the draft, but uh, it just seems like, you know, in in the few weeks before the draft, a lot of these guys get a good feeling about where they're going to end up. Uh, Carolina, good spot, I think, for Burns. Yeah, I mean, you know, we'll see. I I think they run a defense that might, uh, you know, feature him pretty well in in his uh, strengths and what he can do. I don't need him chasing Matt Ryan for the next five or six years. I just want to go ahead and get that out there. Yep. Uh, hopefully they can block him up a little bit. And the Falcons got a, uh, uh, a lineman from Boston College, and they're in the first round. How about the ACC, by the way? Like seven of the first 18 or from uh, – seven of the first 18 draft picks are from Boston Co- – or from the ACC, and not all of them were uh, Clemson guys, just three. You better bring your A game, man. We're not joking around. This is a premier football conference. For real, it is. You know what I mean? Like, and it's got the best program in the country right now. So, hey, and but they only had three. You also had NC State. You had Boston College. You had Duke. You had Florida State. So it's it's good to see. You just hope Florida State can, uh, um, you know, get back into get back into that echelon with Clemson and Alabama. But either way, I do think um, that's that will be a good fit for Burns and just good for him in general. Like, I, I just like number one that he had the big freshman year, and then. You know, the sophomore year was a disappointment. There's no other way to say it. He talked a big game before the sophomore year. Um, didn't really live up to it except for the Clemson game. And then the the going into his junior year, man, not only did he play great for most of the year, he was always on the field. And I've said that a lot, but it's 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 easy when you're not playing when the team's losing to just kind of, I don't know, go through the motions. But my man played as hard as he could seemingly on every snap, and he played almost every snap. So good for him, man. I'm glad uh, his hard work and, and his work ethic and everything paid off, and uh, he's now a millionaire. Yeah, man. Uh, obviously, defensive-minded head coach in Ron Rivera, Eric Washington is their D coordinator, his second year as the, the D.C. They have him already crazy. I mean, as we record this, it hasn't even been 15 minutes 
since Burns got drafted. He's already on their roster on the on the Panthers dot com website. What number? They listed they have, as does defensive he have a number? End. Does he have a number? Uh, they don't have a number on him, but he is listed as no. a defensive end. Uh, they got Brian Cox Jr., Marquise Haynes is a guy that played at Ole Miss. Uh, they don't have a lot. Of, he's only the four. He's, they got five defensive ends on the roster, but I don't know if he'll also maybe work in at linebacker. Obviously, Luke Keekley uh, is the stud there, but they got Shaq Thompson, Brandon Chubb at linebacker too. So a lot of talent there, but obviously with them taking a the first round pick on him, they 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 see an immediate uh, you know future with him there. So hopefully, also keeps Jameis upright. Don't don't harass Jameis. Just just unleash it all on Drew Brees. Although I really like Drew Brees, I, I love. Yeah, Drew it's kind of hard for him to root to sack any of these guys, really. Yeah. Yeah, just, just save it for the not the uh, non division games, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe the the more important story that comes out of the draft, the postscript, is uh, Trey Wingo talking about Brian Burns <laughs> on the way to commercial break, just wrapping things up, talking about how Brian Burns has produced every year that he's been at Boston College. Where yeah. would he get that idea that that Brian Burns plays at Boston College, Corey? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It might have something to do with the uniforms. And I think, according to my Twitter feed, he actually said it twice. He no made kidding. the mistake twice. It, so it wasn't just a slip-up, necessarily. Uh, my man was genuinely confused. I think some... I mean, I, it must be the uniforms, right? Like, that doesn't make any sense to be anything else because, you know, a, a Boston College player had just been selected two picks, two picks prior. Uh, yeah, the, folks, I apologize. I, I apparently just cursed there oh. when I, with that slip of the tongue. But... Um, two picks prior. That's a tough. That's a tough three-word stretch there to say. Yeah. Um, and so maybe it was just on his brain. And my man looks at those the uh, Florida State highlights and thinks he's watching Boston College. Ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous. Fair. I think it's fair. Yeah, I don't. I don't think he'll have the impact that like Derwin had. I don't. I don't think he'll be uh, up there for defensive rookie of the year stuff, but I think he's going to have a pretty good career. I mean, I just think he's, he's too athletic and I know folks, he didn't produce the, the sack numbers of tackles for loss that people want, but the fact that he was able to get in the backfield so much, be so disruptive, you know, they talked about, he went on a 5,000 calorie diet, gained all the weight for the combine, didn't lose any of his speed, you know, with that kind of work ethic, that sort of dedication, it's hard to see him not finding a, 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 a He'll hang around the league for for six, seven years. I would think at you know, uh, I don't want to say best case or worst case, but that's that's probably about a shelf life out there. Probably even more. I, I don't see him flaming out early. I don't see yeah, him being it, the it, uh, the guy in the two thousand uh, the guy that you didn't want to mention by name specifically when you were adding up your recruiting class points, and then you had to add another variable so that he didn't outscore. Was it Charlie, Charlie Ward, Ward or, or Dion? Charlie Ward, yeah. uh, Marvin, like all Terrell Buckley, like yeah. all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's Jamal Reynolds, who was good in 2000. He was a really good player, and he won the Lombardi. But uh, yeah, he he probably wasn't on the same uh, level as Marvin Jones and Charlie Ward and Peter Work. But the thing with Burns is, you know, I I think Florida State fans for whatever it's not for whatever reason. I think the ones that grew up on the dynasty. When they think of defensive ends, they think of Bowler and Renard Wilson and guys yeah. like that. You know, Bowler I think had like seventeen sacks one year, just some yes, outrageous sir. number. Yeah. But Burns had ten sacks and like sixteen tackles for loss. That's a lot, especially when you're not getting great production on the other side. Like he had a lot of attention focused on him uh, for the majority of the season, so he did produce. It's not like he was just all flash and no substance. I, I he had some big games, some big moments. Um, all three years, you know, mainly his junior year and uh, the Clemson game his sophomore year, but I think even his freshman year, just as a third down guy, he had like nine and a half sacks. He's just a he's a he's a generational type of athlete coming off the edge, right? I, he wasn't a generational player. I'm not trying to d demean the kid. He's just this is Florida State we're talking about, but he they have a, a ton of great players. But he was a generational athlete that if he can keep that weight, man. You know, I, I don't know if you don't. You, I'm not a scout. I'm going to go ahead and say that. I'm not a scout. <laughs> I'm not an NFL coach. I know I sound like one when I talk because I'm so intelligent and I know the lingo, but I'm not one of those guys. But he has that hip bend. You know what I'm saying, Aslan? Right. right. You feel me? Coming off the edge, he can bend. He just bends. But in, in all seriousness, he does have some just ridiculous athleticism. That you have to imagine if he's in the right system and in the right, uh, it gets the right opportunity, that 
he sh- yeah man he should be as long as he's athletic he can move like he like he can right now yeah man he should have a fine NFL career he's they they don't make him like that there aren't many defensive ends that move like that dude I was gonna say I, I understand the distinction you're trying to make between de- generational talent in terms of being a speed rusher in terms of generational player but you know Mark Snyder did say that you know the only person that, that's even close to Burns that he's coached has got that same sort of get off is uh. You know, was it Von? Was it Miles Garrett? I don't know, not Von Miller. Miles Garrett, uh, who he coached at Texas A and M. So that's obviously really high fast get off. You know, Garrett really fast was off. first overall pick. So, uh, best of luck to Brian. Maybe we'll get him on the show at some point. Still trying to get somebody to come on the show as an interview uh, subject, but uh, one of these days uh, it will happen. You got to interview Willie Taggart earlier in the week. I um, saw the cliff notes on it. There's there's one aspect of it I want to ask you about, but first, if you just Maybe give us a bit of an overview. Sounds like a lot of the, the topic centered around offense and the changes there, or at least in terms of coaching staff. Yeah, I mean, we kind of get we're, we're at the point now where what else can we ask the right. guy? Yeah. You know what I mean? Nothing else has happened. Burns hadn't been picked yet. He was going to Nashville. He was in, he's in Nashville. Or he was in Nashville for the draft, so that was cool. Uh, and he sent out a cool tw- uh, tweet video, Twitter video, uh, of Burns getting the call from the Panthers. So that was neat. Um, yeah, mainly about, you know, Bryles and the offensive line and, uh, and so that's, that's the main stuff. There wasn't, there wasn't anything else he did main newsworthy newsy, um, nothing, nobody's heard before, nothing we haven't heard before, but I did think, uh, you know, the, the fact that he did say that Hamsa and Levante, he did like those moves and they're going to stick there. It wasn't just a spring experiment, but it sounds like they're really going to stick there. Um, I do think, man, I, I, I start to get, I'm optimistic about the defense. I'm starting to get optimistic. And in the, uh, when he was talking to the boosters, he did say, um, you know, the linebacker, he thinks the linebackers are going to be much improved, which I know people hearing this could be like, well, how could they not be as long as they're, you know, wearing, you know, as long as they're on the field, uh, they have to be better than what was out there last year. But you know, you never know. He, he does think that they're going to be much improved. And I, I get the feel that he thinks they're going to be a pretty darn good defense. He thinks they're going to be really athletic. Hampson, the linebacker, is a really athletic linebacker. And then I, he said that Levante likes kind of roaming around and being the center fielder and, and making plays. So, you know, we'll see. I, I do think they have a chance to be pretty darn good because they, they do have so much talent in that secondary. Okay. Um, I think so. Don't you? They have talent there. Again, you know, it's it, it goes back to that whole thing. Was that a five and seven roster last year? I, I don't think so, especially on the defensive side of things. No, um, so, as, no, it definitely wasn't. It was a what would you say it was? Probably a seven or eight win roster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. I, it, you know, I, I agree with that. They didn't get the most out. It's not like they milked every single ounce out of that talent. Uh, what they didn't squeeze that stone till it was completely dry at all. But. At the same time, I don't even know if that's a metaphor. I don't even know if that makes any sense at all. You don't squeeze stones to make water. I feel like I've heard that before, but that makes zero sense. It's like a feudal uh, enterprise trying to, to get like squeeze water out of a stone. Right. But, okay, there you go. So I really mix that metaphor. Yeah. Um, they didn't get all the juice out of that berry. Okay. How about that? Is that better? Do you get? Yeah, that makes sense. They didn't get all the juice out of that berry. So... You'd look at that roster and say, okay, that's a seven-win roster, eight-win roster, maybe. So they didn't do great with it, but they had some stuff they had to deal with. I think this year, I think you look at it and say, okay, it's probably eight or nine-win roster again. But they've had a year now, and gosh darn it, they're all a year older. They should be a year better. Uh, I know you lost a first-round pick, but you got Marvin and you got other guys on defense. I do think there's a chance that this thing is taken and we're going to look at an eight or nine win. We're going to look at an eight or nine win team, but I don't think. I also don't think the 2017 roster was a six win roster, right? right. Talent wise, that's, that's fair. You know? um, I will say, I just, it, I, I'm curious to see how obviously that there's so many pieces that are returning. You've lost your best defensive player, arguably, in, in Brian Burns. And this was a unit that struggled as the season wore on. I know it's a large part of that's because the schedule got more difficult, but you know, Harlan Barnett just kind of kept throwing his hands up. Like, we're just trying to make it as simple as we can. You know, just, to, you know, we're trying to make it as simple as we can so they can just go out there and, you know, turn the brain off and just go out and play uh, football. So, I mean, I, I don't know how much more simple they can make it. It sounds like they're trying to actually make it a little bit more, um, you know, a little more versatile, a little more, uh, you know, a little more, I don't want to say complex, but just 
give them a little more options, you know, going to the 3-4. Is the guy is going to be rushing off the edge? Is going to be dropping back into coverage? More of that sort of stuff. Um, so to, to see how they'll be able to pick that up after struggling to, to play a simple sort of scheme last year, that, that'll be interesting. But that, that's a linchpin, I would think, because, as, well, as we, we'll talk about, it, obviously, as the season goes on and as the summer rolls along. But if you feel as good about this offense as, as you should with Kendall Bryles and, and Randy Clements and Ron Dugans, well, then, you know, why can't this team, you know, double the win total? Why couldn't they hit 10 wins? Well, I mean, my whole thing is the defense, but Corey's optimistic. We'll see how that all shakes out. What I want to ask you, Corey, I, I didn't listen to the interview, so I don't have the context of the of Taggart's uh, remarks or, or hear the tone of his comment, but I, I kind of found it a little bit amusing that when we spoke to him in Jacksonville, he talked about the whole battle between ego and, you know, instinct. You know, ego told him, be the play caller. Instinct told him, probably don't let it go. And now he's going with his instinct by letting Kendall Browse call the plays. But then when he was asked about it in Atlanta, it sounds like he was trying to assert the fact that this is still his offense. This is obviously still his program. He's the head coach. I, I just kind of found that a little bit interesting that he – he did say something along the lines, I think, of the fact that like I, this whole handing the keys over thing, I, I kind of want to clear that up. Uh, it sounds like that was something that was on his mind, possibly, or did I read too much into that blurb? No, I, it, I mean, he brought it up. He said it. I, now, I, maybe he just took umbrage. It was a fan that asked the question. And it, it was the guy was just speaking about, you know, about Bryles bringing the offense over and being the coordinator. And he just kind of not even a slip of the tongue, just kind of a throwaway comment, handing the keys to him or whatever. Yeah. And Willie jumped on that and said, I don't get this whole handing the keys over. I'm not handing the keys over. It's still my team. Uh, it's still my offense. He's essentially just calling the plays. And I think it's just kind of a, you know, he's he's talked about it so much now that I think he, he wonders, like, what – what people are going to think if this offense does well, like, oh, Bryles is going to... I don't know if that's really on his mind about Bryles getting all the credit if the team does turn around, but I do think he doesn't want it to look like he's just completely... He's going to be up in the tower right? just taking notes, and he might talk to a coach on his way out to the car. Like, he's still really involved, and I don't... Maybe he he's not a huge fan of the perception of he's just kind of clapped his hands and said, go get him, Kendall. Good, good luck, man. Tell me how they're doing. Like he's still involved. It's still, it's still going to be an offense that he wants to run. He made these decisions. He, you know, he's the one that hired Browse, but he's the one that's going to um, eventually be the guy. You know, it's a, he gets the last say, and I'd assume almost everything. He's the head coach, so I think maybe he didn't like the way the narrative was being formed. That oh, this is all Kendall Bryles. Taggart's completely hands off, no input at all. I think for old old school Florida State fans, I think you're looking at a early '90s Bobby Bowden type deal. Like we all, most people that listen to this show, I think only think of Bowden in the later years when he was like a grandpa, and he did he did no real coaching at all or no real game planning. But in the early '90s, '91, '92, '93, you know he had offensive coordinators, whether it's Brad Scott or Mark Richt or uh, you know Wayne McDuffie before that, but he was still involved. You know, he, but I think it was maybe 92 or 93, he completely handed over the keys, quote unquote. I'm doing it too. I'm saying it too. But he was still involved and he was still on the headset and he still had a lot of say in what was called. I think that's kind of what we're looking at here with Taggart, right? Like he's still going to want his imprint on the offense, even if it's not him calling plays. Like he's going to have a say in the game plan and the scheme. Well, I mean, I would definitely agree with that. But I just think when the, when the game starts, man, um, First off, Tagger, like your offense, is admittedly, is derivative of the Browl system. I mean, that that's one of the places you went and looked at in the offseason when you were trying to salvage things in South Florida. Uh, you just paid him a million dollars here. I, I, I mean, sure he could he can auto he can you know veto any sort of play call, but I, I just that's not why you bring Kendall Browl in. But man. I don't I don't I, I think you're looking at the play calling. I don't I don't think he's he obviously isn't going to be doing the play calling. I think more along the lines of the game planning during the week and how they want to attack a defense. And there is going to be communication. It's not going to be, again, going back to Bowden, it's not going to be how Bowden was with Mickey Andrews. Just, hey, man, do everything you want. You don't even just, you know, tell me if who's. I see. I think it's, I think it's going to be closer to that. I can't see Willie being like, listen, I, I think we should really just go run heavy this week. I mean, Kendall Browse has got his way of doing things. 
He's got his own eyes, his own brains, and the way he sees things. And I, I mean, I'm not saying that he won't take to coaching from Willie. Willie's his boss. But no, I, I, I can't imagine like Kendall Browse is really going to walk in with a notepad and be like, really want to like pick Willie's brain. Like, what do you think we should do this week, Willie? Because I, I really curious to see what you want us to do. I, I mean, I'm not trying to be rude about it. I just don't think that's the way that dynamic's going to work, man. I mean, I, I do think obviously there's going to be input. What are you thinking, Kendall? What do you think about this? Or how about you maybe work this concept in today at practice just in case? Okay, sure. But I mean, I, I don't think there's going to be, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's Kendall Browse's offense, man. At least that's the, that's the way I see it unfolding because, again, you're not going to bring in a guy here at a school that, you know, is the finances are under the microscope in every single aspect of the athletic department right now at this a point you're not bringing in a guy and paying him a million dollars. You're not doing a first, um, you know, thing like that and, and giving a guy seven figure salary to have him kind of co-op the offense with a guy who, you know, kind of puts you in the spot that where you needed to to, to grasp and, and get a guy of that stature. But um, yeah, I understand. I mean, listen, I, I get it. You know, it's it's it, it is Willie Seam. He is the head football coach, and I'm sure there's a certain aspect of him um, that that does want people to know that. I think it's more along the lines of what you're trying to say of. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not just checking out. I'm not just going to roam around and hang out with each segment for 10 minutes and then go play golf for the rest of the day. Um, this is my team. We, we, we want to have a certain identity that I want to create, but I think ultimately Kendall's going to be the one that's going to dictate what it is. Yeah, I just thought it was uh, – I, I did think it was interesting that he seemed to like – again, he said it – he didn't say it rudely right. back to the fan. He was just – he said it laughingly. But you could tell he's kind of heard it maybe one or two too many times about the handing the keys over and it's all Bryles' offense. It just seemed like he wanted to be he wanted to set the record straight that hey again I'm not I'm still the guy this is still my team and if we're in the second quarter and you haven't thrown a deep ball to Tamori and Terry, buddy I'm gonna get on the headset or I'm gonna walk right over to you. I don't know where Bryles is gonna be if he's gonna be in the do we know that yet? Is he going to be in the box or on the sideline? He's on the sideline. He talks about how he sees oh, right. he sees things well on the sideline. So he's going to go up to Bryles and say, man, if you don't throw the ball to 15, I know we don't have a playbook. I get it. <laughs> they know that play. Say 15, go deep. That's all you got to say. All Everybody else is a decoy. If you don't do that, it's on this drive. I am taking over play calling for the rest of the, rest of the game. I feel like he's still he still has that in him. You know what I mean? Because it, it, it is. He's the bo- he's the boss, man. He's the boss. He hired Kendall Bryles. You know, Kendall Bryles was gonna. We don't know where Kendall Bryles would be if Willie Taggart hadn't hired him. But now he's at Florida State, and he's he gets a chance to really shoot up um, the the coaching ranks in the ladder because he was hired at Florida State. He does have a boss, man. And if his boss says throw it up to fifteen, you best believe old number one is going to be throwing it up to number fifteen. Hey, I just really Asma, hope we you, didn't pay a guy a million dollars that second? he needs to know to throw it to fifteen. That's, that's well, just, sure. Yeah. All right, man. Without further ado, then, Corey, let's jump right into the uh, the Renegade Express mailbag. We got a lot of good questions, man. I don't want to gloss over these, but I don't want to make it a two hour show either. So let's see what we can do, right, Corey? Let's do it, buddy. Maxwell Gibbs, wake up. Well, boys, this is the first time I'm posting on the Renegade Express as a married man. I tied the knot with my beautiful bride on April 12th. Congrats, Maxwell. That's awesome. I thought that was going to happen to me, too. But then, you know, life happened. But that's awesome life for you, happens. Maxwell. Congrats, man. And you and Miss Gibby. Do you want to wish any congratulations, Corey? You're just going to hang out. Uh, yeah. Hey, Maxwell. Good job, buddy. I hope it works out for you. I hope you live uh, and have eternal bliss Yeah. with uh, Mrs. Gibbs. Yeah. Question for the gentleman this week. You've given the authority to change one thing in sports. It can be anything. What would you both choose to change? Myself, Maxwell speaking, I change the NBA draft lottery. Rather than the teams who have the worst records having the best chances, I'd give the teams who just missed the playoffs the higher picks. This way you'd see better development right away for younger players, and also you'd see more competitive basketball in the playoffs. Not saying it'll be common to see an eight-seeded team beat the one, but it would be at least a competitive series and be better for the league as a whole. But most importantly, it would eliminate tanking and these crappy franchises getting young, talented players like the Knicks, Cavs, Suns, and sorry, Corey, the Hawks. Hey, man, the Hawks didn't tank. The Hawks won 29 games. They were winning crazy games at the end. They were really trying for some reason. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I get the point. Tanking is the worst. Um, it, but I, you know what else that I didn't realize? So the Hawks had, you know, the Knicks had the worst 
worst record in the in the league, right? I think is either them or the Suns had the worst record in the NBA. Both of them only have a ten and a half percent chance of getting the number one pick. Yeah, that's Ping crazy, balls, right? Like, crazy. Yeah, that's not great. So it really doesn't do a whole lot of good to get the like in the in the Hawks have like a twelve percent chance or a eight percent chance, something like that. Yeah. So it really doesn't do a whole lot of good to be awful. But yeah, uh, well, what would you what would you change? What's your? I was gonna say, do you want to come back to this later so you can think about it, or you want me to to stall for you? You would do. What do you do? You not have one? Um, I would take away possession arrow in college basketball. It should be a jump ball on you know mutual possession or whatever. Uh, college football, I probably would remove the whole when you're you're down if your knee touches the ground. I think you should be tackled or it should be you know uh, whatever you know forward progress, whatever. I, I can't even think of the words right now. But you know what I'm talking about. You should be I NFL do. rules. You should be yeah. tackled. You know, you shouldn't. I mean, imagine if, like, imagine if, if, if Rashad just tripped in Pasadena next to the sideline before he got all the way down where he did. And he just tripped, and he's down. I thought that would suck. But it didn't happen. We're national champions because of it. Um, I'm talking about before the horse collar. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, so I got I, I came up with two, I think. They're both uh around the same subject, but the the reviews in basketball at the end of the games are ridiculous. Ridiculous. Right. So I think they should get challenges. One. Each team gets one okay. in the final minute, and that's it. Or two minutes. You get one challenge in the final two minutes, and that's it. I'm tired of every ball that's been thrown out of bounds. You have to go look at it for six seconds or 60 seconds, I mean, or six minutes. Who knows? Um, and also, I also think there should be some rules of common sense when it comes to the replay. And mainly this is with baseball. The baseball replay system is a joke. You have a guy that's running 30 miles an hour, sliding feet first into a base. Through 100 years of baseball, if your feet get there first, and, you're, and then you're tagged, you are safe. But now, because they can freeze it down to half a millisecond, they can see, oh, wait, his foot just slightly came off the bag before his knee came and hit the bag. Meanwhile, he's got the tag on him the whole time. Well, he was technically off the base for that one tiny millisecond, so he's out. That's ridiculous. That's not in the spirit of the rule. Just like at the end of the Virginia-Texas Tech game, where the kids swipe the ball off uh, the Texas Tech kids' hands, you know that right. that that uh, what was he supposed to do with his hand? Like you could go look at fifteen plays through the course of a basketball game, and if you slap it sideways, yeah, it probably went off the dribbler's hand. But the reason it went sideways is because you slapped it. I mean, that's not that's not in the spirit of the rule either. And so I think we could make replay more of the spirit of the rule. Like we don't want to just miss an egregious call. Where the guy was say his butt was on the plate, and that he w before he was tagged, but he's called out. You want to get away from those egregious calls, but that sense is just that's just nonsense, and it needs to change. Tired that is of it. so subjective. You're I, I'm definitely winning if we're running in a if, if we're doing an election. I'm, I'm I mean my platform's stronger than yours. Plus, what I also want to eliminate is this ridiculous punt. You know the, the punt formation now, where you've got that three man wall. You should go back to the way it used to be, man. You're either a gunner or you're on the line of scrimmage, man. Uh, the punt block used to be one of the most exciting uh, plays in sports. It's now an absolute joke, unless you're playing Virginia Tech. Uh, next sure. question. Sure. Leon Knoll, 12. What would y'all say the odds are of Jimbo being the LSU head coach against the Knolls in 2022 or 2023 are? If he was LSU's coach, is it safe to say Aslan would be yelling, Go Tigers? Probably. <laughs> Corey, after Willie leads the Knowles past Jimbo and the Tigers, what is the first question you would ask Jimbo in the postgame presser? Do you think Jimbo would completely ignore you and Ira in the postgame presser? He might. He would definitely. He, he better chance he would ignore Ira. I think Jimbo kind of liked me. Yeah. Um, Ira, he did not like. So I don't think Jimbo and, and Jimbo's always. And I've said this from day one. He was always really good after losses. Um, he was. He was yeah. always. He, he was always accountable. He'd sit there, and even when his SID would say, "Okay, two more," he'd go, "No, no, we can stay," because he knew we had, in that in those instances he knew we had a job to do. He knew he had fans listening. He wanted to explain things. He was really good about that for the most part. 
but he probably wouldn't. He would do a Russell Westbrook to Ira and just say next question. Next question. Um, I think the odds of him coaching at LSU in 2022 are probably in the neighborhood of 75%. Woo! Maybe, maybe 90%. Wow. The yeah, thing that I concerns mean, me, honestly, the thing that concerns me about that, I would say it's 100%, but I'm not sure he's going to be, if he does good things at Texas A&M, then it's 100%. But what if he kind of middles around and sumlins around for the next three years and just a bunch of seven and eight win seasons? Do you sell that to the LSU fan base? Because he's not going to win seven at, or eight games. He's going to win nine. I think nine's his, his floor there, man. He's a good football coach. I don't think I think the only thing that would stop him maybe is just if they could not provide the absolute the numbers, the raw numbers that he's getting at AM, but I figure they'd they'd find a way. And I think maybe even he is middling at seven or eight wins. I think LSU is crazy enough to talk themselves into the fact that, well, it's AM. AM sucks. We're better than them. We've got a fertile recruiting ground. He doesn't have to he doesn't have to compete against, you know, six other major power five schools for recruits. Let him come here and um you know, he'll make it work here. You know, I think there's probably an aspect of that. But I don't know. He, he sounded somewhat sincere in that uh, interview with Texas Ags, which is pretty much the war chant of, of the a and sure. beat. I mean, he talked about that he is happy there. He is comfortable there. He, he likes the people there. They fit his personality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't go yeah. that high. I'd say probably like 55%. You're, so you think you just said that you think Jimbo is going to win no less than nine games for the next three or four years? Yeah, I man, he's Jimbo Fisher. That's what he does. Yeah, all right. Well, except for 17, right? And well, when 11. he's leaving because he's not getting what he wants here and he lost a starting quarterback at the beginning of the year and he's got a bum of a defensive coordinator, yeah, that'll probably happen. A Happens bum? Why, why are you talking about Charles Kelly like that? I'm sorry, Charls. I love you, man. Well, that's, not, that's not nice. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. That was wrong. That was immature. And um, if he's winning nine games a year at A&M, which certainly is not a given. I mean, that's crazy. Texas A&M has never won nine games a year for a five-year stretch. If he does... It is a hundred percent chance he yes. is going to be at LSU. Okay, he loves that place. He does. It's weird. He loves that place. He that 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 it, it's like it's into his it's in his soul. <laughs> it's like the jambalaya and the gumbo and the etouffee and the muffaletta, muffa, whatever the muffaletta. muffaletta. I mean, he just loves that stuff. He yeah. can't get enough of LSU in that yeah. culture, in that stadium, in that he loves having his own state. Yeah. Where it's all him, man, he would jump at that in a heartbeat if he's a viable option in 2021 or 2022. How upset will Florida State fans get when he actually handles that exit with more grace and dignity than he did in Tallahassee? Will that just be like the ultimate, or like will if he if he's a if he's a punk about it again? Will everybody be like, all right, well that's just in his DNA? Um, suck it, there's, there's no way. The reason that the 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 well, look, it was the third year in a row that he had done what he had done and, and flirted with the SEC West. But there's there's no way to leave one SEC West school for another and do it in a Ooh. in a respectful <laughs> I mean, imagine that. Yeah. That, that that just can't happen. So he's going to leave in a not great way because he, there's really no other option. It's not like A and M fans will be like, Well, yeah, man, thank you for every thank you for all those nine win seasons and the Belk Bowls. That was awesome. <laughs> we'll, ne we'll never forget this run. But he, unless he does something magical at A&M, then I think they would uh, they would probably be – if he makes history at A&M, then sure, they might be, okay, thank you so much. No, they wouldn't. No. What am I saying? No. Zero chance. I they mean, would do that if he went to the NFL. But if he's going to a rival that's, what, 200, 300 miles away yeah. and is going to be recruiting again, no chance. No, yeah. there's there's no way he can do that well. I, I was saying it tongue-in-cheek. I mean, there's, there is no good way to leave. I mean, when I was in Mississippi last week, I was talking to my friends that are Mississippi State fans, and we're talking about you know Jimbo, and they're talking about Dan Mullen. They all hate – I mean, they hate, 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 hate Dan Mullen. Um, and, like, they can't even understand it. It's like, come on, man. You guys are stark full. It's Mississippi. That's Florida. Really, not that, that really Gainesville's better sense. than I mean Gainesville is better than Starkville, but I mean it's it's still Gainesville. But it's like come on, that's you can win national titles legitimately at Florida. You you really can at Mississippi State. He's he's built you into something respectable and giving you dignity. Just be proud of that. Like oh, absolutely not. No, they they hate him. They can't that's stand. Crazy. Him. I didn't know that. I thought they'd have more common sense than that.
Nope, nope. Uh, Captain D underscore 63 adding on to the Jimbo aspect. Jimbo ain't going anywhere as long as AM holds that $75 million contract over his head. LSU had their shot. Move on, LOL. My question is, why did it take so long for the baseball team to show signs of life? Secondly, and this is a football-related question, so let's start the first one before I ask you the second question. Why did it take so long for the baseball team to show signs of life? Corey, I'll postulate the fact that uh, they're young, man. Uh, I know their arms aren't young. The starting pitchers aren't really young. Uh, I mean, Van Eyck is, I mean, he's a sophomore, but I, I think offensively those guys, I mean, Cabell's still trying to come to form. Robbie Martin kind of was struggling a little bit. Reese Albert was in and out of the lineup. I think offensively these guys have, have kind of grown up here in the last two weeks. And it, it's actually funny because I've, I've tried to tee it up for 11 to kind of pat himself on the back, but he never has taken the bait. He pointed this out about two or three weeks ago when they were in the midst of the the worst of this almost, where he's like, you know, these these freshmen, they've got about two or three weeks left of me not yelling at them, and then you know, it's gonna. He kind of joked about it, but he, he said they've got about two or three weeks to to really realize that you know they they have to be relied on, they have to to step their game up, and I think uh, part of it's that obviously, and I, you know, credit I think obviously to Meat because Eleven keeps saying that you know Meat's the one that's been working with Mendoza to to get the swing back, and he's been working with Cabell to to get more contact. So it just, you know, it, it, it you know, it's just, it's baseball is a little bit of a funny sport, man. It always takes a little bit longer for things to happen. Yeah. I think it's as simple as Parrish and Van Eyck. I think those that's that, that to me is what's kind of turned it around is those guys looking like themselves again. Um, as for the first thing, again, I just saying this, the $75 million contract has nothing to do with anything. That's he has a $0 buyout. You can't. You can't honestly think that LSU wouldn't match seven and a half million dollars a year if they think they're getting the Saban Light or the next Saban. You know what I mean? Right. Like that's not going to scare them, and they don't have to pay any of that money. You say A and M's going to hold a contract over his head? They can't. There's no buyout. They can say, "Hey, you're walking away from fifty million dollars." He's like, "Well, what do you think LSU's giving them?" Yeah. Money won't be a money will not be an issue when it comes to whether LSU hires Jimbo Fisher or not. Anyway, just wanted to get that out, point that out there, because crazily, unbelievably, how does Jimmy Sexton keep zero, doing this, Jimbo or a Corey, zero sorry. dollar buyout? It's ridiculous. Second question from Captain D underscore sixty three: Should we buy into the promising look our football team showed during the spring, and is it too much to ask for a ten win season if the signs are right on the offense and defensive sides of the ball? Great show, guys! I enjoy each and every show. Have a great day. Thanks, you Cap. Know, Thanks, Gab. Appreciate that, man. Yeah, uh, I mean, you're a Florida State fan. Is it too much ask for a 10-win season? Absolutely it, not. No. Nope. No. Nope. I, uh, now, you, you can't be crushed if it doesn't happen because right. you got to be a realist. Right. But no, it's not. I mean, there, look, there's how many people, had, how many teams had 10-win seasons last year? 20, 22, 24? I don't know. Florida had one, uh, you know, ab- coming off a losing season the year before. So it can't happen. And there's no reason to think, oh, it's impossible. When you look at that schedule, there is one surefire loss. That's it. All the other, what do they play? Do they play 13 games in the regular season or just the 12? 12. Okay. Well, I know I know. typically. I didn't know if that first. Yeah, that's right. The Boise State game is just a regular season opener. Um, you know, and plus they'll be playing an ACC championship game. Right. Clemson's going to lose twice, I think. Yep. So uh, anyway, so I think if you just look at the schedule, you're like, man, there's only one surefire loss. There's 11 games you could legitimately win. If you win 10 of those 11, all right, sure. I mean, it can happen. You know, you still have you, – you've got guys that can play. So is it is it – yeah, you don't want to get – you don't want to, you know, put all your eggs into that basket because then you're going to be heartbroken when they lose their third game of the year. Don't be like that. But you could be uh, pleasantly surprised if they get to 10 wins because I do think it's not – it wouldn't – it's not an impossible mountain to climb. It's maybe a bit improbable – because these guys have to learn how to like, you know, show up on every Saturday and play hard and win. But if they can start doing that and play smart, yeah, man, they're going to have as much talent as almost anybody else they they line up against. Probably as much talent, right? Except for that game in Death Valley. Yep. Yep. James underscore Noel off topic. Please keep up the Game of Thrones discussion at the end of the podcast. I'm absolutely loving it. He's not alone. I think Grumpy BK uh, gave us a shout out on the show, maybe after uh, last week, saying that he wants us to keep it up. Um, so yeah, Thrones in and out there will uh, be part of the show sure. moving forward. Four more shows, right? Four or five more weeks. Yeah, yeah. 
By the way, real quick, real quick on that. So was that consi- – I've read up on it a little bit since we talked. That And we won't – this just answer it in 20 seconds. But is that considered like one of the best episodes in the history of the show? I don't like talking about it because, man, like I said, I've, I'm a Johnny come lately. I haven't I haven't bled with you guys for 10 years. <laughs> right. Um, sure. But it seems like a lot of folks have, say, have said that. I mean, I think it's – Everybody has come together. It's crazy when yeah. you think about it because of all those great characters, so few of them have actually been on in the same scene together, man. Like we yeah. haven't are, seen. Or they've been gone for three years where they haven't yeah. seen each other. Yeah. So yeah. the fact that they brought them all together, it doesn't feel hokey. I mean, just all the different things, you know, obviously with, with Brienne getting knighted and, and, you know, Theon trying to redeem himself and Samwell trying to pick up the spirits of Jorah. I mean, just like everything and, and then obviously the dynamic with with Sansa and and you know Daenerys and, and obviously Daenerys finding out about John I mean just all that stuff came together so seamlessly and that it sets up obviously you know this Sunday which is going to be the 82 minutes the longest televised battle sequence in history um it's hard to not feel good about that it's um I don't know what I'm trying to think like what 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 great game might have it's like uh beating the russians in 80 you know that wasn't the gold medal game but it set up the great feelings of the gold medal game so uh while the battle of winterfell won't be the gold medal game uh or while this past episode won't be the gold medal game it might be looked upon as maybe the better uh substantive episode in in thrones lore not to get all pop culture and then we'll go on to the actual question but the wire used to always do that too where the penultimate episode of each season was the episode that's yeah. the one where everything really went broke. That's when the all the tragedy, the tragic deaths and, and all the big news would happen in that the second to last episode. Yeah. And then the last episode was try to clean it. So all the, their best episodes every year were the were the penultimate ones, not the last ones. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, James is on there. topic question. We have a dire need for elite pass rushers. I am very happy we picked up a commitment from Josh Griffiths. Who do we realistically have traction with? are on our defensive end board. Check it out, Corey. I saw this question, Mm -hmm. and I went ahead and called somebody. His name is Michael Langston. He's going to break it down as only he can. Corey was almost on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire as a -a phone-a-friend. Michael Langston, always available for us as a -a phone-a-friend on Wake Up Board Jam. Michael, uh, the questions we have for you, obviously, of recruiting nature. Thanks for taking some time out of your day for this. Uh, elite. That's the word being thrown around, whether it's elite pass rushers, uh, elite yeah. prospects, five stars, things of that nature. I guess it's it's two part. Let's I guess let's first start off with, uh, you know, overall, there's no five stars committed yet. It's still early in the game. Should it be concerning to fans that there's not a lot of buzz, at, at least from what people are telling me and from what I see and read uh, with a lot of five star prospects right now in this calendar? I don't think it's it's alarming. I mean, because the main thing is you, you want to get um, your guy. Because I mean, it's April. I mean, these rankings change and and fluctuate. And guys that are four, high four stars could be five stars. But I don't think it's concerning right now. Um, but um, it's certainly a concern as far as the position itself. Just uh, they don't have a flash end in this class and. Uh, they don't currently leave for a flash in in this in this class yet. So, I mean, there's some guys they're serious about. Uh, I think Chance Williams is one. Uh, he's out of Oak Leaf, uh, Orange Park, Florida. I mean, he's one. Savelle Small is another one that they're kind of – he's visited before, but uh, obviously getting him back on campus will be a big deal, and FSU has some work to do there. Um, Gervon Dexter, he's, uh, he's committed to Florida, but uh, – visited FSU in the spring game. He's pretty high on FSU. And so, uh, or not Gervon Dexter, excuse me. Um, Elijah Roberts visited. Uh, he's one that's, but he's more of a strong side. So there's not an elite guy that they lead for. So that part is, you know, somewhat concerned because they need some flash ends in this class. So to that degree, I would say to fans, yes, that part is concerning. But, uh, at the same time, it's still early, and uh, there's so many prospects that we notice in the spring and summer that that evaluate. So, I think it's it's something you gotta you know wait for. But at this point, it's it's a little concerning. Michael Langston, thanks for the information, man. As always, we appreciate it. You got it. As we said, boom, there you go, Michael. Thank you for the intel. 
Um, this also really applies to our next question, Corey. I really wanted to answer that one. Actually, I'm sorry. Want, next time, I'll let you handle the recruiting question. Please. By the uh, way, I just want to point this out to the listeners. I know you have a lot of options for these podcasts for focusing on Florida State sports. We know we're the best one. That's fine. But we're the best one, not only because we're just so lovable, Aslan especially, but my man Aslan, he doesn't just go off the cuff and say, oh, I don't know, or it looks like they're recruiting these couple guys. He actually gets on the horn and gets a real answer for you guys. Like with somebody that really knows like a working knowledge of what they're talking about instead of me just making up names because I would legitimately make up names. So for Aslan to actually go out there and get the answer you need and you're asking, man, he's, that's the extra mile. That's what I'm talking about. That's got, what we do at Wake Up War Chant. We go the extra mile. You got to know your weaknesses, Corey, and I know my weakness. Um, yeah. I'm not fully versed right now on the recruiting board. I, I probably will be here in the next few weeks as Michael and I start traversing the state on the spring tour, uh, but that's for another episode. Uh, George and Oles 86, wake up, fellas. Want to know your thoughts about FSU and the lack of recruiting elite talent players in their position recently? This also kind of dovetails into Michael's response. Uh, we are not in competition for any number one players at their position. Bringing in elite talent is what built this program. Look at the 2015 class, and since 2016 to today, we have only had five five-star players that come to Tallahassee. Uh, actually, six. He left off Lars Woodby. Uh, Levante in 16, Cam and Marvin, Kando and Kalen in 2017. Uh, do you think the lack of development after the 15th season started to stunt the growth of the program? Yes, right? I mean, we've done stories on that. Sure. Yep. Do you think in order for Willie to have success, he will have to really show he can develop less talented kids? That is according to the composite rankings. I do. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, not to speak for Corey, he's on the show, he can do it for himself, but so much of the, the promise and the hope of Willie was the fact that when he got here, he was just going to be this recruiting juggernaut, and, and once he got rolling, you know, watch out. That's still a possibility, but at least here in, in the near term, man, it, it's going to be guys like Keyshawn Helton. Um, it, it, you know, it's going to be guys like Jaleel McRae that it sounds like they're relying on to, to help turn the culture around and, and, and be productive members of this football team. And these are guys that, that were not rivals, 250 guys. At least I don't think McRae was. Um you know, I know he did go to IMG, but I, I think that is, uh, it, it, ironically enough, like that's going to kind of have to be, and maybe his MO, man. I mean, at least right now, because to to the point of the the question here, there's not a lot of number one guys at their position that Florida State's in the mix for. Michael said as much when when I spoke to him there. Um, it, it is kind of a, a, a ironic twist of fate, but if if he does show that he can. I mean, Keyshawn Helton has 800, 900 yard, you know, re uh, receiving yard season. If, if Jaleel McRae's got four or five picks and is uh, a, a pretty good tackler in open space, it's, it, it does give you some hope and, and, and belief, I think, in, in Willie's recruiting ability because when he is able to get this thing rolling and then he can maybe get his foot back in the door of these elite recruits and not sell them on, on five wins and, hey, help me turn this thing around and be the guy that, that turns it around uh, as opposed to, hey, you know, take it to the next level. Uh, he'll be that much more positioned for it, and, and this team will be that much better off for it. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all that. Uh, I, I, I don't think really have anything to add. I just think, not to state the obvious, win eight, nine, ten games this year, and maybe the and I do think the floodgates have a chance of opening up. Right now, advisors, parents, high school coaches, I don't know how many of them are sold on the direction of Florida State football, with good reason. And it's not just this season, it's the last season too. I mean, you you lost whatever you lost, 13 games in two years. So there's a reason to be skeptical. Give them a reason to not be skeptical in 2019, and then I think you see some real gains uh, on the recruiting trail. Yep. Uh, Bimini Bound, finally caught up on Game of Thrones so I can listen to the show again. I have a <laughs> four-year-old that stays up way too late, makes it tough to watch Game of Thrones. Yeesh. Yeah, I guess that happens, right? Yeah, or you could watch Game of Thrones with a four-year-old. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, I probably wouldn't recommend that. But you know, listen to Corey. His I think son's they wouldn't even uh, like Brady. The most trouble Brady's ever gotten in. This might be true. I think it's actually true. When he was five or six, it must have been six. He kept wanting to rent. He kept wanting to watch Ted because it was a teddy bear. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's that's a kids' movie. Can we watch Ted? Can we watch Ted? He might have been seven. Uh, no, Brady, it's an adult movie. No, it's not. It's a teddy bear. Anyway, we find out 
we get because he we would sleep in. Brady was old enough. He would come downstairs when he was seven, and he would turn on the TV and watch his Disney, and then we'd get up at whatever you know ten noon whenever we got up, feed him. Anyway, we get the cable bill one month, and on back to back days, a Saturday morning and a Sunday morning, he rented Ted and Ted Two. <laughs> My man watched them both. And I, there are some scenes and I've never seen the second one, but there are some scenes in that first one with Ted and the way the, the woman that works at the groceries. I'm like, what could, what was going through his seven year old brain? How, what was he thinking? What, when did it, when did it dawn on him? Oh, I sh really shouldn't be watching this. So anyway, he, he, uh, yeah, that's definitely as much trouble as Brady's ever gotten in, but you know, but he's all, he's better for it now. You know what I mean? Yeah. So maybe your four-year-old will be better for it if you just explain them what's going on with Game of Thrones and y'all sit there and enjoy it together. Tell them who the Night King is. Yeah, uh, Corey, I try to do the way you guys do on uh, headlines and, and try to uh, you know solicit questions from people. So uh, part of mine was asking folks to make a prediction on uh, what character would survive and, and one that would die in this coming week's episode of Game of Thrones, uh, The Battle of Winterfell. Uh, Bimini Bound, follow directions. So shout out to Bimini. Uh, he says the next to die, he thinks is going to be Sam. He thinks Samuel Tarley's going to die. Oh. Um, he thinks a hefty fellow has used up his character role in telling Jon Snow that his real name is, you know, spoiler, Jon Snow. We won't tell you Jon Snow's real name. Anyhow, all the while, Jon Snow still, all right, anywho. He doesn't say who he thinks is going to live. Um, but that's all he wants to say. Glad to be able to listen again because he's now caught up on Thrones. Saw we got a couple stud recruits. Go Knowles. Uh, indeed, Bimini. Indeed. Welcome back. That's, the a good, I, that's, a real, that's really good reasoning, by the way, for, for why he thinks he would go down. I, I, that would be an awful one. It, people would feel bad about it because he's a pretty likable character. Yeah. But that's really good reasoning as to like his he has used up his uh, usefulness. Right. Yeah. The Navy good Knoll. Thinking, good morning, fine sir. And Corey. A few rapid-fire questions I would like your expert opinion on. There seems to be a few players on the football team that are literally just taking up space. If a scholarship player is not producing on the field but otherwise is a good student, can their scholarship be revoked? In other words, is a scholarship like a contract or is it performance-based too? It is one-year renewable. Yes. Um, most programs worth their salt will not pull a scholarship just because you're not playing well. Uh, it does happen occasionally. But typically, they are treated as four-year scholarships, even though technically they're only one-year renewable. And yes, you can ask a per you can tell a kid you're not going to be on scholarship next year. Yeah, that very, very, very rarely happens. What does happen is, hey man, you ever thought about maybe uh, going back home? Right. Maybe playing, maybe playing closer to home, or we you, they they will have conversations where they say, look, we're laying it all out here. Here's the deal. We don't see you being a part of our plan in 2019. We don't see we're not going to give you a ton of reps. We don't think you're gonna you're gonna be a real difference maker on a depth chart. If you would like to pursue other opportunities, we give you our blessing. But typically, they don't just say, even though they could, they don't just say, "Hey, you're not as good as we thought. You're off the team." I don't know if I can ever remember that happening at Florida State where somebody – there have been guys that have been kind of just – what do they call it now? Uh, I can't even – Attrition? I can't even think of uh, yeah. Well, no, I was thinking of something else, but um, uh, another word, and I can't think of it right now. But there, there have been cases where guys have been kind of hinted at, told. Processed. Maybe not even, pro, there you go. There have been – some guys have been processed through the program. Maybe they had a senior year because they redshirted. They had a redshirt senior year where they were still eligible, and they were told, man, don't bother. But it almost never happens. Where almost literally, I can't think of a time where like a sophomore was just told straight up, "We're taking your scholarship, so peace out." I wonder if there's like some accountability with the coaching staff if they'll just be like, "Listen, man, like this kid's trying, but I just obviously did not do a good job of evaluating his tape, so we'll let him stick around. So like we won't process him. And if there's if there's the thing where it's like the kid's not maybe." doing as much effort and they don't feel as bad about it. You know, like, well, listen, man, like you're just not, you know. Yeah. I put my neck out there to bring I, you I, here and you're not holding up your end of the bargain. So it'd probably better if you go somewhere else. But yeah, I think that. I, 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 yeah, I definitely think that happens. Uh, uh, Navy Knoll asks, which Game of Thrones character do you most identify with? 
Ooh, uh, for me, probably the uh, the bald eunuch guy. Varus, really? You're not Varus. Come on, Corey. I, I got my hands in a bunch of different honey pots. Always got my ear to the grindstone. I did it again. Yeah. I cannot get a metaphor. Are you Jason Witten? Is this Monday Night I Football? <laughs> I can't get anything right. This is ridiculous. Uh, anyway, I I don't I don't know. I like to think I'm like uh, uh, what's Peter Dinklage's name? Tyrion. Yes. And I I say that because his dad had a very similar name, which made it very confusing. Tywin. Tywin. Yeah, it's like, come on, man, make it. I kind of identify with him. I'm not the tallest guy in the world. I do like to think I'm sort of clever. Um, and I think I'm I'm kind of a decent person, and I think he's a decent person. And I try to be funny. It's kind of a split with me. I, I would say somewhat of like Tywin Lannister, because I'm I, I think I'm all about my lineage, my my legacy. I want to have right. like my my family kill it. Like I, I need a, I, I want a son. I mean, I wouldn't mind a daughter, either, but I want a son so he can be a quarterback and uh, put the Hudjavani name on the map. But then, um, part of me is also like the Hound. I just the Hound is just it's me. Like you know, you think he's kind of a rough jerk, which he kind of is. But underneath him, there's our there are redeeming factors. Um, he has done good. But for some reason, people like to focus on on the bad that he's done, and ultimately, he really hasn't done all that much bad stuff. He he killed the poor kid that was Arya's friend in season one, but it was on yeah. orders from the king. You gotta do what the king tells you. Um, you know, it you know, wasn't on happened. orders from the king, right? It was on orders from Joffrey. But right, it yeah. wasn't the king yet. I think, and then we'll move on. Who was the guy that the mountain crushed his head? Oh, um, Dor, the guy from Dorne. Uh, yeah, his the name dude escapes was, me right now, but uh, yeah, him. but that's who you that's who you are. Why? Because I look like him a little bit. Because he looks like he's like Middle Eastern. Is that what you're no, saying? No, because he, because he's he he's he's very he, he's he's got some he's got high self esteem. He thinks he's right. He knows he's right. He's a ladies' man. Damn, all right. that's in play, buddy. Plus, yeah, you do look like him. But it was those other things more than that. Although he did swing both ways, but. Anywho, uh, if you could pick one Game of Thrones character that you could guarantee survives this battle, who would it be? Arya. Um, I mean, John is John too much of I mean, like I don't want I don't want to see John die. Um, I'll say John. I'll say John Snow. Oh, that's that's a cheapy kind of because he's such a man. I, I can't see him dying at the Battle of Winterfell. Um, Prince Oberyn. Prince Oberyn. There you, there you go. Attaboy, Prince yeah. Oberyn. Yeah. I mean, the Hound's going to live because the Hound's got to fight his brother the Mountain eventually. Um, no, man, ah, the answer is Arya. No, nobody wants Arya to die. Arya. All right. All right. Next question comes from Grumpy BK. Wake up! Since this has transformed into a Game of Thrones discussion, yes, I love this. Um, I'll attempt to weave football back into it. Playing off the Navy Knoll question, which football player or staff member identifies with a Game of Thrones character? Would oh, it be boy. Francois as Jamie Lannister, hanging with the wrong crowd, gets oh. cut, literally, and is trying to earn his way back into the football scene? Jawan Williams as Samuel Tarley, a big teddy bear with little physical skill but is kept around because he might know something? Your thoughts? I mean, I that's gonna be a, that's gonna be a tough one. I, I don't know that I could do something like that on the spot. I'll say Francois is actually more probably like Theon, as any he, he had a really good setup. You know, it might not have been ideal having to come here in red shirt for a year, but he he got a scholarship to the floor state to be a quarterback. Theon got taken away from his family as a ward of the Starks, but there's a lot worse families out there. They took you in. They, they made you part of the family. They did everything they could to make you successful. Jimbo setting you up, doing all he can, and then you kind of blow it. And then, you know, you, you try to redeem yourself, and then you kind of blow it again. So I would say DeAndre's more like Theon, and hopefully DeAndre will have his payoff moment here where he's able to help a team back to success elsewhere. And it can have a happy ending, but yeah, I don't, I don't think he, I don't know, I don't, I would put him up there with Jamie Lannister, maybe because Jamie was so like flamboyant and brash, but I don't, I'd almost say uh, Francois, you know, you know, 
poor uh, Theon got mutilated. DeAndre's knee got you know all messed up. So maybe that's part of it. I would say I would say uh, Jimbo is uh, Cersei. I don't like that. I know that's why I said it. Running anyway, goal. are these all Game of Thrones questions? You should have warned the people ahead of time because there are. I know we don't believe it, but there are people that don't watch that show that are completely lost. Well, it's just a reminder to get get on board with it. Well, <laughs> yeah, you're losers if you're not watching this show. We're moving at a pretty good pace with it. Running Noel, wake up. Hey, Aslan and Corey, it was so good to see both of you and Gene at Top Golf in Jacksonville. We do love our Seminoles and our Wake Up War Chant. Glad you got to meet a bunch of your loyal listeners. As far as our football team, I attended Florida State in 1974 to 1978, graduated oh. in 78. I was there pre-Bowden, during Bowden, and post-Bowden. My senior year in high school, we went 0-11, and they were seriously considering getting rid of the football program. So I have seen us go from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs. I was at the national championship game in New Orleans and Pasadena. My feeling is... I am a Seminole fan. Come hell or high water, I do believe Willie is the right man for the job, and he will get things turned around. I also believe Jimbo will be at LSU in two years, and I believe our baseball team will win 40 and wind up in Omaha. I agree with a lot of that. Yeah. Wouldn't that be something if they end up in uh, Omaha? You know what's crazy? And people, again, I I say this. I know our audience kind of skews a little younger. It's podcasts, newfangled technology. Um my mom would have no idea how to listen to this, even if she wanted to, I've even tried to explain it to her and it just, it's not clicking. Um, When I wrote it, I I did a story like the 40 year anniversary of Bowden being hired. And so I went back and read up on his first season and their very first game in 1976, they played Memphis and they played this kid from Florida. He was a running back and he was a, he, I guess he was a pretty, a pretty good running back from Florida that actually ended up going to Memphis. And they talked to him before the game about getting to play Florida State. And he said, yeah, uh, at the end of the day, I just wanted to go to a program where I knew I could win, not some also ran like Florida State. Oh. That that was 1976. Yeah. The very next year, Florida State won 10 games. And Memphis legitimately hasn't been heard of since. Like, that's – it. it We've lived our lives so much with Florida State as a national power that it's hard to remember a time where they weren't. But my man that asked the question remembers that time. He lived it. My dad lived it. I mean, there were times when they were awful. And, you know, now it's almost it it is ingrained. And it's like it's a birthright for a Florida State fan to be good and not go through a five and seven season. And you shouldn't. You really shouldn't go through a five and seven season. Just like whenever that was a few years ago where Kentucky didn't even make the tournament in basketball. And Carolina's had losing a losing season of basketball. There, there's never an excuse for that. That should never be understood or, you know, it just shouldn't be. You should always be upset by that. But I do think, man, through it all, man, for the last, what, 42 years, Florida State has been really, really good. It's going to come back. I believe it. I'm on board. I've, I've been to two of these booster stops now, Aslan. I bought in. I bid on a Charlie Ward jersey. I'm so bought in. <laughs> I'm ready for this. I'm ready for this thing to turn around. You know, I, I do wonder, you know, Southern Cal had a rise and a fall and a rise. I think you know, Oklahoma probably has had three good runs. I don't yeah. know. Could you really call Stoops a good run? I mean, they got they got to the national title game a, a few times. Only yeah, they were always one. in the conversation, though. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's you know, no reason to think that Florida State can't get back there. I think the one aspect of the, the dynasty that I, I'm not even that well-versed on, I don't think a lot of people talk about it enough, is the fact that, I mean, a window opened, a door opened, opportunity presented itself for Bowden and, and Florida State as, as Florida was struggling and, and was about to face sanctions. And the fact that they were able to capitalize, I mean, you, you talk about that sort of, I mean, I don't know. It's I'm trying to think of like what movie. It's like um, a perfect know, storm. Like Ocean's Eleven or something, where you only have that split second of the power going out to where you got to do all your stuff and make all your chaos happen. Like what? Where are the chances? Or I don't know. Like Armageddon? Do they have to like sync something up and then hit the meteor at the right second? I don't know. How about Back to the Future when you have to have the the freaking the the, the car has got to hit. That that power line as the bell tower is getting struck to to get Marty back to 1985 in the first one, like you have that very small window of opportunity to make everything happen, 
And, like, you know, Bowden and Florida State did make it happen. That's something I don't think people really t- – it's just like, yeah, he built it. You know, people talk about the fact that he built it kind of like, you know, it, it was a step-by-step process. But, you know, the, the fact that, like, Florida did fall into hard times – and they were able to fill that vacuum. It sounds like an easy thing maybe in hindsight, but I, I think that's something that we probably don't really grasp or talk enough about. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, soon enough we will. You know, soon enough we'll, we'll, we'll get back to remember the good old days and things like well, that. Well, and also remember, you know, and I touch on it a little bit, but, you know, Timmy Jernigan doesn't come to Florida State if Urban Meyer doesn't resign for because his heart hurts or spend yeah. more time with his family or whatever happened. And I think there were probably maybe Waysom and a couple other guys – not that Waysom was an all-time great, but he was a starter um, for that one season and good. He was good just, in twelve. But he really Jerry was, Pruitt's was just, like nah, just never played again. Yeah. Um, so, and I'm sure there were some other guys that maybe would have flipped to Florida or gone to Florida in those eleven and twelve classes if Urban Meyer had stayed. But he left. Florida was in flux, and Jimbo pounced. Yep. Much like Bowden did in '85 when uh, Florida was cheating all to hell. That Bowden pounced in that 85 class, but get the 87 class that beget number four rankings and national championships. Yeah. But yeah, it all started with that 85 class. But also, he had set the real quick, and I know we'll go. He had set the foundation. It wasn't like they were they were choosing UTEP, right. like they were choosing a good program because Bowden had done a lot of good work in those ten years to make it a, a viable destination. If something happened to Florida, and something happened to Florida, and uh, Florida State was all over that. Yep. Uh, running Knoll ends with, never watched Game of Thrones, but you guys convinced me to try, so I watched season one, episode one, and now I am obsessed. I'm getting HBO right. and starting to binge watch tonight. Thanks for keeping us entertained. You guys are the best. I tried to tell Stephanie. I tried to tell Ira, and they just can't get into it. And I, and I tell them what you tell them, what everybody tells them. I am not a sci-fi nerd. I'm not a fantasy guy. I yeah. don't like that stuff. I don't. I, I haven't. I've seen one Harry Potter, the first one. I haven't, I haven't read any of the books. I saw Lord of the Rings all once, and it was like I'm never gonna. I don't ever have to watch that stuff again. And then I, I'm just not into it. And then one day on a whim, I just started watching Game of Thrones, and I had no idea what it was. I didn't know it was a book. I thought it was gonna be about like ancient Egypt or something. <laughs> and then in the first five minutes, it's that scene where the guys like. I think it's a white walker kills those guys on the horses. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, and the dude was like, uh, he's like, well, thank God we're not children then like mocking them for, yeah. for being scared. Right, right. And then he gets his head cut off or whatever the heck happens. And I'm like, man, okay, this is kind of cool. And I try to convince Stephanie, but all she cares, she keeps asking me if people have sex with dragons. <laughs> Well, she's got bachelor. Well, I don't get about Ira is the fact that uh, his wife, Kim, watches the show, right? That's with it. Kind of. That tells me, honestly, that Ira doesn't really respect Kim's uh, taste <laughs> at all, which now, is weird because she chose him. Now, now. But when it comes to pop culture stuff or TV, he's like, oh, that's goofy. Well, then you're, t- you're telling me that you think your wife's goofy. Yeah. I don't like that, Ira. I'm not going to stand for it. Watch Game of Thrones. I know you listen to this show. Watch it. Man, I'm so tempted to punt on this question because the show's already over an hour. Um, I'll be quick. I'll, I'll do it in 35 seconds. You're not going to be able to. But it's, it's Big Steve-O22, who's been a member since August 11th, 2008, and this is only his third ever post. Man, well, then we have to answer it. That's exactly. Crazy. That's what I'm saying. Um, he says, what's up, fellas? I got a topic for you guys. Assemble your all-time FSU team. I believe you guys oh. have done this at some level, but I want to switch it up. For offense, which 11 would you pick to run a pro style and 11 to run the spread? What does your starting defense look like? Who is handling the kicking and punting? Who would you select to coach these boys to? Head coach, OC, DC, all the position coaches. Also, are you more excited to watch the next episode of Game of Thrones or Avengers Endgame? Game of Thrones, I haven't seen any of the Marvel movies, so yeah, Game of Thrones. That should tell everybody listening to this that hasn't watched Game of Thrones how good it is. Because my man doesn't even watch any of the Marvel movies, no. and he's still obsessed with Game of Thrones. He's it's not a best. sci-fi dork. It's the best. It just gets its claws into you. Man, yeah, that would uh, that would be that would be really, really hard. I will say... How about this? The... I'll ask you the questions. You, you try to give me as quick of an answer as you can think of. Like, or just uh, agree-disagree thing. Charlie to run the spread, right? Correct. Okay. Um, head coach has got to be Bowden. Correct. OC 
Ricked. Yeah, unless Jimbo's a possible. Yeah, Rick. No, because that's not. That was in his role. Yeah, yeah, you're right, right Rick. Well, it D- was for a little while. Yeah. Uh, DC Jeremy Pruitt. No. Kidding, kidding. Mickey Andrews. Charles Kelly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mickey Andrews. Running backs. Yeah, we're not going to dive too far now. And receivers. Jeff Bowden. Obviously. Well, let's not. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Obviously, Jeff, you saw what Jeff Bowden did with Peter Warwick. Uh, I just wish one of the big regrets in my for my. Florida State fandom that I had for so long is I would have loved to see Randy Moss under the tutelage of Jeff Bowden. <laughs> we were all robbed to that. see it. So he, who would have known? We we don't even know where he could have gone. But uh, I mean, hey man, we can make fun of the guy we want. I guess I just did. But he did have a ton of wide receivers that produced. They were awesome, like Menace and Javon, Anquan Bolden. I mean, all down the line, Audrey Peter Ward, Cooper. Dugan. Um, I will say the two receivers. To me, it's uh, if we're just going to go two, let's we can't go four, but our Peter Warwick and Rashad Green, Kelvin Benjamin would be my third. If we got a third, I think you know I I like somebody retweeted a photo of like the 1956 NBA championship team. It was Bill Simmons, and he had like this emoji because it was all a bunch of like six one white guys. Yeah, and there's no way they're going to beat even you know Iona. Um, right. But like Ron, what Ron Sellers, the numbers he put up in that day and age, like holds up to what happens now, which to me is amazing. Oh, um, it's crazy! He had like three two hundred yard games. Yeah, um, yeah, I, maybe he'd be my fourth. I just it's just hard for me to comment on him because yeah. I never saw him. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Um, how about this? I will say. I mean, in terms of the eleven on offense for pro style and eleven to run the spread, I really think. I mean. I keep everybody the same except for maybe quarterback. Pro style, I'd probably go with Jameis over Charlie. Yeah. Otherwise, I, I mean, like, saying, yeah. Who, I, I like think who would you change? Is, what would change in the pro style spread in terms got, of the? I mean, I don't know. Like, I think Work. I mean, do, do you put you know Dalvin? Does does Work done start in a pro style over Dalvin? I mean, or, or vice versa? I mean, I don't know. I, I think you have maybe you know William Floyd blocking for Dalvin Cook. Okay. Um, and you also have a tight end, which I guess would be, you know, Pat Carter or Nick O'Leary, whoever you want to, maybe two tight ends. But you get, you know, instead of a tight end, then you have an extra wide receiver, I think would be that. I think your offensive line is Walter Jones, yes. Jamie Dukes. Yes. I Probably Brian Stork at yeah. center. Yeah. Um, another guard. Uh, what the about other Rodney Hudson? Like, yeah, you know what? Well, not at center, though, because he didn't play center at Florida State, but I'd put him at guard. Okay. Along with Jamie Dukes, and then your other tackle, man, there's a lot to choose from there. Maybe Trey Thomas. Yeah, I was gonna say Trey. Thomas. Uh, Alex Barron was awesome. Um, I mean, they they've had a few. The defense is the one that I think's interesting, and that's obviously that's just eleven. I think your defensive ends are uh, who you want to go. You gotta have Ron Simmons in there somewhere. Yeah, Bowler. Yeah, I think you have Bowler at one defensive end. Maybe Renard at the other. Just go with the 96. And then in the middle, I think you have Simmons. And then you probably have Jernigan. I feel, Jernigan like, was I feel a, like we're forgetting somebody that might be a little bit more renowned in the interior. Oh, are we? I don't know. Maybe not. Oh, there's a ton. Look, there's Corey Simon. Yeah. There's Broderick Bunkley. There's Travis Johnson. There's all these great players. I just think Jernigan, man. Jernigan's one of the best college defensive linemen I've ever seen. Yeah. And he stepped up huge when it mattered most. Like, I know he was a second-round pick because he failed a drug test at the combine. That dude was an awesome college football, like a game-changer. Yeah. But, yeah, that's the thing with Florida State. It's so hard. But, in, in quite frankly, you would probably pick those other guys now, in hindsight, over Ron Simmons. But it's just Ron Simmons was so yeah, dominating when he in his era – and he was, uh, you know, he was a guy that was really kind of a bell cow of the whole program there for a while. Yeah, I ain't, I ain't uh, putting nobody in front of Farouk. I ain't crazy like yeah, that. Yeah, you can't do that. You can't do that. And linebacker, it's obviously Marvin, Derek Brooks, and I don't know, Paul McGowan won the Butkus. Yeah. You could throw him in there. there uh, Talbot Smith was awesome. I mean, there's a thousand of them. It's really hard. It's hard, but it's impossible. Yeah. Corners are easy. Safeties. LaMarcus, maybe. <sighs> And Leroy Butler, although Leroy Butler was a corner at Florida State for a good bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Mangum. 
Big Steve-O. We'll get to that one of these days when it gets really, That's really a hard slow. one, Steve-O. I'm sorry. The corners are Dion and Buckley. Those are the two locked down we know for sure. Yeah, there we go. Two last uh, folks. This one is Seminole Mike. One, hey, guys, got to admit the car show sounded better than I thought it would, though I'm not sure I can condone the multitasking by Corey. <laughs> Thanks for the 411 on Busy Bee, though. Apparently, I'll have to stop at one next time I find myself on that stretch of I-10. Uh, two Absolutely. things on that. Corey, um, unfortunately, I feel bad. Apparently, somebody reached out to us trying to get us, uh, try to uh, mediate something between us and Busy Bee, but apparently, I think Busy Bee is a, a pro gator uh, enterprise, which I, I really did not need to know because now I don't know if I can enjoy the bee the way I used to. Also, when I was driving out to Mississippi to go hang out with my buddy, um, I passed through Mobile, and there was that Bucky place or whatever, the Beaver. Uh, yeah. I didn't stop at it, which I hate myself for, but, man, it looks like it, it might even be more grandiose than the bee. So It's crazy, right? Oh, it's, it's insane. <laughs> it's bigger than the busy bee. The and gas I didn't know pumps are literally it. it's like three football fields long of gas pumps. Yeah. It's it's like the strip in Vegas. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, I didn't know that about busy bee either, but I, I would say if you're a Florida State fan and you're in the busy bee next time, if you miss the toilet, yeah, no, no word, no harm, no foul. I also think, really though, realistically, if they are considered a pro Florida type gas station, they might want to reach out. There's a lot of Florida State fans in the area too, on that stretch. I, I would, I would dare say, there's more Florida State fans on that stretch than Florida fans. You ain't lying. Mm, so, All right, here we go. A couple questions. Do you think so? The advertise with us, Busy B. Advertise yeah. with us. Questions from Seminole Mike. Do you think the concept of no playbook and essentially playing backyard ball to some degree could ultimately affect recruiting negatively for high caliber players? Could the experience of playing in a structured system be considered important when NFL teams are assessing players? You all think I'm probably going to say yes. Uh, I, I do think about when Cam Newton was on Gruden's quarterback camp thing and Gruden was like, give me a play call. You did at Auburn. And, Cam was just kind of like, uh, I, 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 and he's like, just give me the, the most verbose play in your, and he's like, well, he's like, we really don't do that. We just kind of have signals. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. What a travesty to football. This guy doesn't even remember his play calls. He's going to be a, he's not going to be a good quarterback. And he, he's a good quarterback, Cam Noon. I think with the fact that Kyler Murray went first overall, Baker Mayfield went first overall last year. Uh, folks are picking Lincoln Riley's brain. You know, they asked Lincoln Riley, "What's what's been the weirdest thing about all the attention he's gotten from NFL programs and teams talking to him?" And he's like, "Probably the most surprising thing is how surprised they are when I show them how simple what we run is." So, you know, I don't know. Passes prologue is is applicable here, but it just. Maybe it's to the point now where the NFL is starting to resemble more of what we're seeing on Saturday. So maybe in some weird way, Willie's going to be ahead of the curve more so than Jimbo, since Jimbo seems to be a little bit more clutching to his old school pro style thing. And maybe at some point, pro style is no longer pro style. I mean, it's it's going that direction, right? With yeah. with what's going on with the the draft picks coming out of Oklahoma, I will say. When we hear no playbook, and I made the mistake too, it wasn't a mistake, but just maybe the assumption that I, I didn't quite understand how that worked. And I asked Willie about that on Wednesday, actually, at the Top Golf. And when you hear no playbook, doesn't mean they don't have plays. Right. They have right. a lot of plays. In fact, Taggart said they had just as many plays. The difference is how they teach it. Now, instead of sending a kid home with a binder to like look at an arrow doing a post route, like it's the 1980s, they walk them through every play in everything they're supposed to do. This is what you do on this play. This is what you do on that play because they have to go fast. And it's not like when players are out on the football field, they're looking at playbooks as the plays are being called. They have to memorize the plays. They just think Kendall Bryles has always thought and has always taught that the best way for these guys to memorize the plays and to play fast is to not actually give them a binder with plays in it, but to go over all the plays on the field, not in a board, not in a room with a board and diagramming it out, but actually going on the plays and showing them that way, having them run the routes that way, having them learn the concepts and the plays that way. So it's not back. It's not like the, it's not as much backyard football as maybe um, we thought it was. It's not at all. Actually, it's the same offense. It's just, they teach it differently, but it's just as, it's got just as many plays and variations, according to Willie, 
as the one last year or as the one Oklahoma has. It's just not necessarily a playbook where you hold and and if you get cut, they tell you to turn in your playbook. Hey, how would you do that now? Like if <laughs> if what would they do on hard knocks? Pull out pull out that thing from Men in Black. Yeah, yeah, take the chip out it. of their brain. Yeah, yeah, just make them yeah, just flash mem- flash and uh, destroy their hard drive. Second question, hypothetical. Trey Fisher decides he wants to be a walk-on for the good guys. Does Willie take him, and does Jimbo allow it? <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. No, I think he would. What? If I, I, well, he would. If I mean, I hope Jimbo's the kind of parent that would 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 say yes to if the if their kid really wanted to go to a place. Dad, all my friends are going to Florida State. I love Tallahassee. Um, I pro- I might not play at either place, but. College Station is the worst, and we all know you're going to be in Baton Rouge in seven months anyway. I'm not going to come to College Station and have to tip cows for my fun while you're out eating etouffee and muffalettas <laughs> 300 miles down the road when I could have just stayed in Tallahassee this whole time. I so, think Jimbo. I think Jimbo would let him. I think Jimbo would let him go to Florida State if he wanted to go to Florida. State. Heck, he let him stay in. Uh, in Tallahassee and play at Godby instead of going to College Station with him. Well, that's that's different. He's got all of his I friends know. here. So I mean, what, if if Shanna's husband was going to coach a little league baseball team and, and Brady was like, "I'm going to go play for Ryan's team," you'd be like, "Yeah, go ahead, that's fine." I'd be like, "Sure, man," but you're just not going to be in the will. But <laughs> hey, do what you want, buddy. Go play with Ryan. That's well. I see what you're. I see what you're saying there, but it's a little different. Jimbo did leave. Yeah, no, you're right. Jimbo did leave Florida State and. And I do think that I don't think he has any ill will towards Willie Taggart. I hope not. I would hope Jimbo in his heart of hearts, and I, I'm almost certain this isn't true, but in his heart of hearts, he's rooting for Florida State to succeed without him. Yeah. By the way, he signs off telling us that he's writing to us uh, from Harrisburg. I, by the way, I couldn't even really hear what you said, Corey, because it's raining so hard, and I apparently have like a tin roof. Um, but anyhow, Seminole Mike says that he's writing to us from Harrisburg in South Central Pennsylvania, home of a one Milton Hershey, or for Corey, Milton <laughs> Hersey. Stephanie gets so mad because I brought up the uh, Anaheim and that she thought it was in Nebraska. And I'm like, look, that is not anywhere as close to as dumb as me going my whole life. Because no, who, whoever really talks about Anaheim, maybe it comes up in conversation twice a year, right. maybe depending on who you're friends with, but probably not. Everybody eats Hershey Kisses. Yeah. It's everywhere. There's Hershey bars. In my whole life, until I was, I don't know, 38, 40, I, I, I've, been to- I've been calling it Hershey Kisses and Hershey bars in Hershey, Pennsylvania. I think that's much worse than uh, thinking Anaheim. is. Well, not much worse. Nothing's much worse than that. But it is worse than thinking Let's go. My thing is, how did nobody stop you? I don't I was understand like, it either. It doesn't make sense. It's crazy. It's not like we, I wouldn't say the word. It's not like I went those. I mean, I, who, everybody says the word Hershey. It's just part of the lexicon. We said, it's a, hey, you want a Mars bar, a Hershey bar, a Hershey, her, I still say Hershey. I can't <laughs> stop it. So I, I don't know, man. I, I blame my, I blame, uh, I blame my friends. Just like if you see pictures of me from like eight years ago before I started shaving my head. Yeah. And I still had like the kind of weird buzz cut, but I was bald. It's a terrible, awful look. And I blame Shanna for it. <laughs> Why did you let me go out in the public like that? You you know better. I don't know any better. I'm just a dumb dude. You knew better and you let me go out in public like that. Well, I blame all my friends for letting me say Hersey for the first 40 years of my life. By the way, shout out to Ira for finding that screen cap of you on um, uh, no, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. That was nice. Yeah, how about that? And what's funny about that, because I saw the picture. I'm like, oh, that's right. I didn't have – it was 2008, so it was before Facebook, or at least before I had access to Facebook. Yeah. And so it's not like I had 12 or 20 pictures of me on my computer. Yeah. And, I, you know, it's before phones. It's before I could just take a picture. So it was this whole – I had to go – I'm pretty sure we had to go buy a digital camera. Oh, jeez. Just to take that picture. And I know where – I, I was wearing this orange T-shirt. They're like, we just need a face. We just need a mug shot. But I didn't know where to stand. So I didn't have any pictures on the computer of me and no really easy way to get them because my mom couldn't send me any. So Shanna took a picture of me standing in front of our bare wall with a orange shirt. And it looks like I'm either in a hostage negotiation <laughs> or I'm in prison. 
And when uh, you see that picture, and imagine if he had picked me, and I had been on the phone for like a minute and a half talking to <laughs> Meredith, and then trying to—I mean, I would have been uh, uh, my my picture would have been so big. I'm uh, really happy he didn't pick me. Now that I look back at that picture, you look like a guy that wrote for Spin Magazine back in the '90s. <laughs> Like you look like Matt Pinfield's like younger I know, it's ridiculous. Like, intern or something. All right, let's land this plane. This has been our apocalypse now three hour show. Uh, last one. Deer Fuel Two. Good morning, guys. Really enjoyed the show. First time in thirty three years that I am not drinking the Kool Aid. Remember when you were a teenager and you got sick from drinking too much of a specific alcohol? Mine was bourbon. Well, I couldn't even handle the smell of bourbon for a couple of years without having to shudder. It was an involuntary reaction. That is the same reaction I have when I try to partake of the Kool-Aid now. I hope this coming year we see a completely different team from last year. The actual football season is short. Drinking the Kool-Aid during the offseason is a big part of the joy of college football, so this is uncharted territory for me. I don't I don't have a lot of uplifting stuff. I mean, I, I do think, you know, do be optimistic. The offense is going to be better. We'll see how the defense is going to be. Corey feels good about the defense. I just wonder, I don't know if it's because has, has life beaten me down, Corey, because I'm, I'm not even joking. Even when it was Drew Weatherford, um, you know, 2006, 2007, just the, the teeth of the lostness, I still went into every season thinking, you know, they – they can maybe make it in, into the BCS national. I, I legitimately thought that. I legitimately thought every year they they got a shot. They they still have a shot at making this happen. Maybe like two thousand eight nine when Tebow just started tormenting us, it became a little. You know, I'm just like, ah, here we go. Just you know, bend over and take it. But even then, I would still be like, you know, man, we can do it. We can still pull it off. And I, I think the 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 weird thing is. If you're a Florida State fan going to the season, you're, you're not expecting a, a college football playoff berth. You're not expecting going to Charlotte. Like, how do you calibrate? How do you go into a season thinking, like, I'll be cool with eight wins, nine wins, awesome, ten wins, hell yes. Because two years ago, you're going to the 17, you're like, they're going to win a national title. Last year, you're like, it's a new coach. There's that excitement. So I do wonder where – you build that that positive momentum. I just think the offense is it's going to have to be fun to watch on, on several occasions this season. So uh, that's what you're hanging your hat on. Drink the Kool Aid on that. Yeah, and I agree. I think you know it's it's weird when you think about you, you like you said 17. It was a it was a bad season, but you started at number three in the country, mm-hmm. and then the year before you started what ten in the country. The year before that eight in the country. The year before that number one in the country. The year before that, you won the national championship. The year before that, you were number three in the country at one point in the season. You're so used to being top ten, even when the seasons didn't turn out great. You, you know, when I think when they lost to Louisville, sixty-three to whatever, I think they were like number three in the country when that happened, or four. I mean, it was it was. There, you're so used to being ranked so high and being in the conversation, at least in the preseason until you know midway through September, or late September, that it is tough to recalibrate that man. When was the last time a Florida State fan started a season with so few expectations? Just get me eight wins. You well, know, I, I literally, I, I don't, never. because you're right. Like, even in the middle 2000s, you always thought, okay, well, they're young. Next year's the year. Yeah. And then in 08, you're like, okay, because they won some games in 08. I think they won eight or nine games in 08. And then they had Ponder coming back. And you're like, okay, man, they got a chance in 09. Now, they didn't. And then 010. Uh, you're like, okay, well, this is Jimbo's first year. We're excited about this. 11, we think we're going to be great. So, I man, I would go back. I don't even know. I don't know that I've lived in a year where you – I don't. I, I really can't recall living in a, in a year where you went into the season thinking eight wins is going to be – eight wins would be a nice season. This has never happened for Florida State fans. He's right. It is uncharted territory. So it is hard to, like – adjust to lot like it's it's a weird off season. I get it, man. I get it. And it's not just that they went five and seven, as we pointed out. Six of those losses were by like three touchdowns or more. Yeah. It's not like you could look at that season as, oh man, if you just recovered that fumble there or tipped that pass there or caught that pass there, you're Inches. eight or nine wins. Because you could do that in the mid two thousands, remember? Right. Or even in Jimbo's b- bad years, they can't it would come down to the final few plays. Right. It, not this one. This one, you got run off the field a lot. So I get it, man. And the proof in the pudding is I, I, coined, I coined that a couple weeks ago. I don't know if I told you that. 
right, right. that I can't be I, iron sharpens iron obviously has taken off. We've seen that just by my Twitter feed. Um, but proof in the pudding is something also that I've, I've really started to, I, I don't know where it came from, but that's what it's a, it's a saying that I came up with, but the proof in the pudding won't be, you, there's got to be no proof. There's no pudding until August 31st. Yeah. Everything else is just talk, I, including it, this show, which has been a ton of talk. It has been. I will say this going out. You have a very likable quarterback in James Blackman. He, yep. That's you, that's, a, that's a nice thing to have. I mean, I'm not saying DeAndre was unlikable, but I, I think you can probably appreciate more of James's journey uh, maybe at this point in his career than, than what DeAndre had. You're going to have two really good running backs. I think Willie said in Atlanta that Cam's going to have 1,000 yards, and I'll leave it at that. Kalen is, is going to be fun to keep tabs on. Terry's an absolute beast, man. Terry is is upper echelon, you know, is poised yep. to be maybe top three, you know, top definitely top five receiver in Florida State history. It'll be fun to see this offensive line for all the, the warts and the thorns. Like, they're going to play better on offense, and they're going to get more time. There's going to be bigger holes getting opened up. And one or two of those guys is going to is going to kind of come out of nowhere and make you say, dang, that's 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 super cool to, to see them kind of grow. So those things are there. And those are the things you should look forward to. And I agree, man. Like so much of college football is it's the it's the twenty four hour, three hundred sixty five day cycle of it. And if you're not gonna, I get it. You don't want to get your hopes up, but like what like what hopes are there to really get up, man? Just just go into it knowing that the team is gonna look better. Uh, they're gonna sneak in a couple more wins this year. You're gonna go bowling again. And there's there's a lot of good sort of individual storylines, and the offense is gonna move the ball. Uh, that should be enough to make you happy. And you're a fan, man. You're you're a Florida State fan. This is part of what it is. You got to be there in good times and bad times. Uh, it makes things that much more enjoyable, man. I mean, think you think about the just the depths of where we were six years prior to winning. I mean, Jimbo's first year. I remember his first game in Clemson. I was there, and they just looked abysmal. I mean, especially in the first half against Clemson. Yeah. Six years later, national champions. I mean, just yeah. you got to take well, it with the bad man. Yeah, his first year as the OC, you mean? Yeah, yes, it was yes. it was abysmal. They scored like two. They were awful in that first half. Right. And I will say this real quick on the way out. They have a likable quarterback. Man, they also, to me, have a likable head coach. Yes. yes. You really do want to see this guy succeed. And I just can't. It's it's the interactions that when I'm not recording, when I just talk to the guy. And, he, you know, he did it again. Uh, you know, I was joking with him. He's like, man, these top golfs are awesome. We need to have one of these in Tallahassee. Yeah. And I go, I, go, I agree happen. 100%. And I'll I'll open up one with you. Me and you will pony up the money to open up a top golf. And I said, but you've got to be the majority owner, of course. Naturally. And, and he laughed and we and we joked around about that. And it's like, man, he's just he he's and you you see how he interacts with the fans at these things. He he really he listens to you, he looks in your eye, he talks to them. It's you, you want him to succeed, man. You just want he is a likable dude, and I really hope that two years from now, wake up war chant. Is going to be in where Atlanta for the national championship game, watching Willie Taggart become the first African American head coach to win a college football national championship. Hell yes! Hey Corey, what's up, Valar Mogulis? I don't. What was that? Was that Dothraki? It means uh, it's the Bravosian. Come on, man. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. I, well, we we're talking about Game of Thrones so much. Yeah, well, that's what it is. It's from the show. Anywho, oh, Corey. Well, I, Good solid week of work out of here on the program. Knowles taking on Wake Forest Friday through Sunday. Three games set on the diamond. Uh, take the series. Keep the good vibes rolling. They got them projected as a three seed now, either in Nashville or College Station. We all oh, know which cool. one I'm rooting for and which one mm -hmm. Corey's rooting for. We'll see also, real quick, uh, let me add real quick a little uh, shout-out. Well, not a shout-out, but uh, kind of pimping my own work. The uh, number five class. Oh, in yes, our top yes, five yes, all-time yes. classes that that is on the website that will be on the website on Friday morning. Uh, I don't know when, probably nine ish, nine a.m. Yeah. So get on the website and see uh, who finished uh, with the fifth. Who finished at number five, number fifth place in the uh, all-time recruiting class war chant rankings. If you made it this far, thank you so much, everybody. I can't believe I'm still talking. I, I can't believe this. With this, how long? What are we at? What's we're the at, time? We're at over an hour and a half. We're at over oh, an hour and a half. Word. What a great oh. show. He's Corey hey. Maslon. Have a great weekend, everybody. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. 
Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. WARCHANT.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.